Hello, welcome uh, to Under the Bonnet. This is our, our last in, in this present series. We're coming back in the autumn, I'll tell you more at that at the end. But we're going to look today at chapters 38 to 39. And um, Fiona and I will be having a fight later on about the chronology of this, as promised. Um, but Fiona's going to read, just to start off with, chapter 38, which is the one we didn't read in, in the service. So Fiona, if you could read that, please. 38 verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, go and tell Hezekiah, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David says, I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city. This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. I will make the shadow cast by the sun go back the ten steps it has gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So the sunlight went back the ten steps it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said, in the prime of my life must I go, down, go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years. I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life, and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn. But like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I'm being threatened, Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. For the death, for the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you as I'm doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me and we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Isaiah has said, prepare a poultice of figs and apply it to the bowl, to the boil and he will recover. Hezekiah had asked, what will be the sign that I will go up to the temple of the Lord? So, um, this is, th these chapters uh, of narrative that we're looking at mm. are at a hinge point in the whole book of Isaiah. It's the reason why we started looking at Isaiah at chapter 36 and 7, because they're so important. Um, so we've had poetry and prophecy. We've looked at two chapters which deal with one event, which is the uh, uh, destruction of the Syrian army in front of Jerusalem. We're looking this week at two chapters, one of which is what you just read, the healing of Hezekiah, and then the other is uh, Hezekiah showing the Babylonian envoys around his city, effectively, a palace. Let's call that A, B and C. What order do you think they're in? And when I say you, of course, I don't just mean you, I mean you Me and... Me being an Old Testament Hebrew scholar. You and a few yeah. other people like me Don Carson. and Don Carson, and, or maybe I should say Don Carson and me. Um, and Alec Matea. Alec Matea, yeah, not a lightweight, and also David Jackman. So in quite. Do you know what company, Tim Chester thinks? I think I can't. I know. To be honest, I have no okay. idea because I didn't look. So y you and your gang um, all think. What is the order? If I if if I put that there as A B C, you think the order is? Um, the order is B C A. 
Right, so basically, so... he's healed from his illness. Then he um, shows the envoys around his palace, and then there's the Assyrian siege. So, do you want to know the reason for that? Yeah, go on, go <laughs> just quickly. The reason for that, um, although again, this is just from the commentaries, is basically chapter thirty-eight, verse six. Um, uh, verse 5, God says he's going to heal um, Hezekiah and add 15 years to his life. Verse 6, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Syria. I will defend this city. And so. Just going to stop you there because that could also <laughs> mean, as I said in the sermon, it could be because the Syria is still alive. It's rather like a uh, kind of like, what would you call it? A hurt animal. Yes. Um, that's weakened but still very dangerous. Yes. So Snacrib's still king. Uh, he's lost 185,000 mm. men, but he's got a whole load of other men, and he could buy in presumably more men. And he, he, but if I'd been Isaiah, I would have then written, and I will keep defending you as I've already defended you. I have delivered the city, and I'll do it again. Um, so that's one of the reasons. And then yep. the other reason is because Isaiah 1 to 35 has been primarily about Assyria and yep. the king of Assyria and the threat that Assyria. Um, was to um, God's people and the second half is about Babylon yeah. and the threat that Babylon is to God's people and so what it appears has happened or what Isaiah might have done is he might have um, finished the Assyria bit with the Assyrian siege and then begun the Babylonian bit with the Babylonian envoys yes so um, and and in fairness uh, we come to this with a very modern mindset. But if you look at this, and in, it, you'll yeah. see the Gospels, the guys are very happy to move mm. around. The chronology wasn't particularly mm. important to and them. And Isaiah is not chronological, no. is it? We we know that um, because there's so much poetry in it and there's quite a lot of um, this sort of big Syrian siege, Assyrian siege event and quite a lot of the kind of prophecy sort of goes around that rather than... Mm. Rather than chronologically, so we'll agree to differ because it's it not really it's not very important. It doesn't make any it? difference. No. Okay. So um, yeah, so that's that's quite important. Um, really exciting that we've come to the end of the first half, mm. and the second half of Isaiah is much more well known, um, and and will be fantastic to um, to to look at. Um, so just tell us, just remind us about. Um, uh, your sermon and the sort of the, the the big outline of that and the main things you wanted to communicate. Yes, I mean the question that that, and I think this is such a good question to ask, is why is this here? Mm. Um, yes, yeah, so that's always a really good. Question always the right ask. question because it, yeah. it, it it elicits so much helpful stuff. And b because on the face of it, a king healed from a boil and a king g gives a guided tour of mm. some blokes around his palace is not really that exciting. Having seen. Assyria destroyed in front mm. of the gates. So why why does he think it's so important to include Anne, not just him, but also two other writers, the writers of Kings and the writers mm. of Chronicles, have also included mm. these events? With a lot why? of detail as well. A lot well. of detail. A, a huge amount of detail. It's like he's kind of... It, it's really strange, isn't it? Because in three verses, practically, you've got 185 people killed and, and um, Sennacherib dies. Mm. And then you've got two chapters on something that arguably is is not nearly as big as that. So yeah, he's he's kind of hovering over these um, these events, isn't he, um, for a reason? And I think the simple answer is the hope of humanity is not in humanity. Mm, yes. And that's actually a big deal because if you look everywhere at the moment, the hope of humanity is in humanity mm. everywhere across mm. the board. Um, whether it's it comes to the environment, defeating disease, dealing with war, um, and we want to say on a much bigger picture the hope of humanity is not in humanity mm. and particularly about the biggest problem we face which is our alienation from God. Mm. Okay, So we'll come to all of that later. I think that's what he's making the point. So chapters 36 and 37 are, are showing us Hezekiah, the kind of the almost messianic king. You know, here he is intervening, God answering wonderfully. Mm. It's fantastic. And we're thinking, ooh, is he the Messiah? 38, well, no, uh, he's mortal. Um, okay, he gets another 15 years, but he will die. We know then he will die. Chapter 39, he's flawed. He's really flawed. He's proud. He's self-reliant. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually, because um, I guess 37 is is kind of... Um, 
is Isaiah's gospel, isn't mm. it, really? The rescue from the enemy, the enemy defeated, God's people rescued. Um, that is a kind of salvation event, isn't mm. it, in Isaiah? And so then, as you say, that kind of makes sense in the bigger picture that actually this this king is not the rescuer. He he isn't uh, the rescuer with a capital yeah. R, is yeah. he? Yeah. So, no, um, thank you. Um, uh, you spoke about... Um, Helpfully about um, uh, Hezekiah, um, he was thirty nine when he got ill. Yes, um, that we know from kind of putting the dates together. Um, and at this and point, by the way, I think um, that's probably your biggest time. I think the dating oh, okay. is probably the biggest time. So dating doesn't quite work with it the other way. With round. it the other way around. So I think you know, in deference to you, the dating <laughs> seems to Thank make more you sense. Very much. Again, what do we know about it? Because we're not. No, scholars and historians no, and so exactly, on. So. Exactly, um, exactly. You said that he had no heir at the point at which mm. he was ill. How, how did you know that? Because we know his heir, Hezekiah's son, was Manasseh, yes. who was a wicked and evil king, wasn't he? Yes. How do you know that he... Uh, the dating. Manasseh comes to the throne age 12. You do all the dating okay, and everything. Okay, okay. He's, he's going to be born three years after Hezekiah's illness. Right, okay. So... So, yeah, so that is striking that that's probably is one of the reasons that he knows that, that he definitely wants a longer life is so that he can hand over. Um, yeah, I mean, I, son. I was quite hard on him because I basically said when he gets the news, he's going to die. He whines like a little baby. Mm. And there's there's truth in that. But I, I maybe have been a, I may mm. have been a bit harsh on him because actually he's he's so upset mm because yes he hasn't got an heir and every king wants an heir but he's 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 in the messianic line and and he's mm. you know here he is being cut off in his prime no heir and mm. it's kind of well what's happening to your promises god i'm arguing that from science because he doesn't say any of that no but. it doesn't but it is interesting it says um in verse five this is what the lord the god of your father david yes. says so that reminder yes. that this is the the covenant keeping god who hasn't forgotten his his promises um, to um, to have an heir descendant from David. So he turns his face to the wall and prays. Yes. Is there any, do we know? Yes. Because usually we say when somebody turns their face to the wall, that means they've kind of given up. Um, but do yes. you know where that relevance of that is? Yes, I do. And the other person who does that, I'm flicking through the Bible, I'm probably not going to find it, is... Um, David's one of da King David's sons. Oh, uh, maybe you can help me. I'm just trying to find the name. Uh, one of King David's sons. It's a horrible story, but he ends up raping his sister. Is that Ammon? Is it Ammon? Thank you. you I know. can't remember, but I don't know where it is. Yeah. And Tay. Tamar, is it? I think it's his, Tamar. his sister. Let's call yeah. him that. Yeah. Um, it's a horrible story. He's basically pining after her. Yes. And she's resisting him. Yes. And he goes and sulks and turns his face to the oh, wall. Okay. It's the same kind of okay. language. And that's why I think it might be that. And then also, I mean, it's just mm. it's just a rubbish... Um, uh, 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 you know, uh, whereas Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and he prays. It's not a great prayer, right? A good prayer no. would be, Lord, you're fully entitled to take my life. Yes. I, I'm not I'm not perfect. I've not lived as I should. Yeah. But you've made promises to me, you know, I'm in the line, please, yes. on that basis. He goes, yes. remember, Lord, I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion have done what's good in your eyes. Yeah. It's, it's not the best argument. No. I mean, he's done some good things. He's done some he? great but he things. he doesn't deserve. But he's not perfect. No. He doesn't deserve no. it. So he's not, he's not looking, he's, I guess he's looking at what he's done rather than at yeah. who God is. And that is that is a warning. I thought that was quite challenging what you were saying about the bucket list. Yeah. That lots of people, um, probably to be fair, middle class people, yes. Um, have lists of places that they want to go and things that they want to do before they die and actually that's not a Christian concept <clears throat> we need to be thinking about how we can serve God before a he takes us a bucket list of good deeds yeah yeah which was a, a really helpful um a really helpful challenge um what what did you make of his um uh, the yeah let's talk about the um the shadow that's yeah. interesting yeah. i don't know so look it, it uh, there are 
Okay. There's a bit in Joshua where Joshua's fighting a battle and the Lord causes the sun to stay in the sky at night. Yes, uh, I sorry, that. Yeah. Sorry, it causes the sun to stay yeah. in the sky during the day. Yeah. And he kind of holds it there so that they have longer to fight their battle. Yes. Okay. That is full of all sorts of problems that thankfully we don't have to argue now. Mm. That's not what's being said here. All we're talking about here is a shadow cast by the sun on the steps of a tower. Mm. So very localised. Well, it's hugely localised. Mm. And so I think Hezekiah's sitting in his sick bed and he's looking at this and he's seeing it go down every day, go down every day, go down mm. every day. And God says, I'll give you a sign. I can make it go down or I can make it go up, we learn in Kings or Chronicles. And he says, well, it's easy for it to go down. Could it go up? Mm. And God goes, fine. And then the question is, how does that happen? Well, it could happen by God reversing the, the, the direction of the sun in the sky. That causes all sorts of mm. problems. But he's the creator God and he can do what he wants. Mm. However, you would think that somebody would have written down, and by the way, it's a really weird, weird kind of thing that happened this day. Mm. The sun went the opposite direction of the sky and we were all amazed. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think it's... it's it's God is light, and it's we know. Interesting that I'd never even thought about that, but there is a lot about um, light in you know the people walking in darkness have seen a yeah. great light. Um, Isaiah sixty, which we're going to be doing with women on Wednesdays, the Lord will be your everlasting yeah. light. Um, yeah, so that is an and interesting. And Revelation, where yeah. the 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 sun will no longer be there, the moon yes. will no longer be there, but the Lord will be the light. Yes. So. I want to argue there's a greater light even than the sun in a Mediterranean sky. Yes. And that's the Lord. And so if that light shone mm. and surpassed the light that was around, I'd love to do a little test on this with a, a dim torch and a bright torch. I'm sure you could Whether do Whether you could, yeah. Anyway, I don't... I'm No, no, I no but it's, it's an interesting idea. I think what's also interesting that I read is that he adds 10 hours to the day and he has 15 hours to oh, yeah. Hezekiah's yeah. life as well. Yeah. So whether yeah. there's any kind of link yeah. there and also the fact that A has in his sinfulness in chapter seven refuses a sign, oh, that's good. doesn't he? And yes, Hezekiah he does. Um, receives a sign yeah. um, because the, the two are often contrasted, aren't they? Uh, because yes, it, it, um, it is a very striking thing. Um, what did you make of so verses 9 to 20 are almost like a psalm hmm. a psalm of Hezekiah what what strikes you about that I think the hopelessness mm. um, just no hopeless the hope in this mm. at all you know that that if I'm dead I'm dead um, I mean what is he the prime and my life I must go through the gates of death well you understand that that's fair enough um uh, but I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living, verse 11. Um, okay, I understand that. But then he talks about, um, uh, where is it? Yeah, verse 18, look, the grave cannot praise you, death cannot sing your praises. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living they praise you as I'm doing today. And it's kind of like, that's the opposite of how Christians think, that actually the great place of worship is the mm. new creation. Will be heaven, absolutely. So my thinking, and, and by the way, he's not alone. I think David uses similar yes. language. Yes, yes. Um, so my thinking is that the Bible is progressive revelation, and yes. at this stage they know so little there's about life a, beyond yeah, the grave. Yeah, there's only a hint of, of life yeah. beyond the grave. Yes, it, it's... The, the pictures Isaiah uses are clever, yeah. aren't they? And, and quite striking. So his life is like, and it, this comes up in 2 Corinthians, doesn't mm -hmm. it? His life is like a, a tent mm -hmm. that God is going to just take take down. It's been pitched and it's going to be taken down. It's like a, um, a weaver um, weaving um, weaving cloth. And just cutting it God's off. just cut the cloth off the loom. Um just snipped off his life um, and then um, like a lion uh, God has uh, shattered him um, and then his weakness in verse 14 hmm. his prayer is is like a, a dove or a, a weak little bird hmm. and his eyes are growing weak um, yeah it's 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 very striking isn't it he's he's uh, he's in this trouble but but verse 17 is is encouraging I mean, that again would be what we would understand mm. of the gospel, wouldn't mm. it? 
God's love, in God's love, he's put our sins behind his back. Um, so yes, there's glimpses even here of the gospel. I think it's ironic, verse 19, parents tell their children about your faithfulness. And yet in the next chapter, he's saying, well, I don't oh, really I care what happens. Yeah, that's because just as long as it's all right when I'm alive. Mm. And you wonder whether that had an impact, his attitude mm. on his son, Manasseh, because it's just so tragic that he was generally a good king and Manasseh was was wicked and evil and then things really went downhill. Yeah, I thought about the application to that, but the problem is yeah. um, y you will know, having been here a long time, you know, um, uh, good parents... Yeah. Um, can raise their children perfectly yeah. and children turn away from God and, and mm. I won't get I won't say bad parents but perhaps mm. parents don't raise them spiritually as yeah, well and yet they the come to faith home and they become in Christ yeah, and it's there's no yeah absolutely it's not not um you can't necessarily no, follow no. it through so we don't know why Manasseh mm. turned out to be so bad but no no yeah. um so were there any other things you wanted to bring out of um of that chapter um no, I think I think it is. He's mortal. It's it's striking. Um, he's mortal. I mean, I think you'll be given fifteen years. Yeah. You know, who of us would want to have a time set on how mm. long you've got left? It's like having a big clock on your computer counting yes. down all the time. You yes. Know, today you've got one less day, but in yeah. reality we do we do we, we have just no don't know idea. the time and it might be a lot less than 15 years as you said and i think one of the challenges for us is not to just we're constantly making plans oh, i am mean, mm. making plans oh you know when i'm this age i'll do that when I'm this mm. age i'll do that and we just don't know do I don't we know. no absolutely absolutely because our life i mean that that is one of the applications that that uh, verse 12 and 13 that our lives are incredibly fragile aren't they hezekiah yeah. knew that um, interestingly, I mean, what he did get right was he knew where to go in trouble. Yes. So verse two, he may have prayed quite a self-centered prayer, but he, but he did pray, mm. didn't he? Um, which is what he didn't do mm. in chapter thirty-nine. Um, so I sadly. think carpe diem would be, you know, one of the things: seize the day, yes. um, because you don't know you're going to get tomorrow. Yes. And some, you know, live this day with the Lord Jesus Christ to the best of your ability and delight in it and delight in him and the life he gives you yes and in resurrection hope for the christian look forward to the new mm. heaven mm. and the new earth so uh lovely michael shaw who yes. died this week um he would be a good example of that he served god faithfully didn't he and we know we have every confidence now um, that after a life of hard service mm. um here and abroad not an easy time um, that, that he is now um, with the Lord. I, I think that's one of the things I love about being in a church family is you have this constant reminder of birth and death and the fact that, that there are so many people that we know and we have loved who, who have gone to heaven already. Mm. And that's a really, right. yeah. that's a really um, good thing to be constantly reminded of, isn't yeah. it? I guess when you're young, if you don't know anybody who's older and died, it's yes. very easy to just live as if you're more immortal mm. but in a church family yeah we we see it all the time don't we mm. so yeah let's move on to chapter 39 mm. then this marduk baladan he was a bit of a um bit of a kind of hero wasn't he a bit of a um what's the word a, a kind of um babylonian um, freedom fighter freedom that's the word i was looking for not terrorist freedom fighter so if anybody's yes. expecting a child please marduk baladan would be a great name <laughs> I don't think about that. <laughs> Doesn't it mean worshipper of? <laughs> Mark <Maybe laughs> Balladon so would be a very bad yeah, name. Yeah, very bad name. Uh, so I mean, this is this is interesting, isn't it? That that uh, here we're we're looking at, at Hezekiah being flawed. I mean, up till now, mm -hmm. yes, okay, he may be mortal, but he's he's been great actually. He's he's made some daft political alliances, but he's been good, and uh, he's probably been one of the best kings out. And now it just comes a bit kind of crashing down which is my point earlier we constantly want more life more life give me more years give me more years do you really want more years you know i only want more years if i'm going to live for christ i don't want more years if i'm going to turn away from him and bring shame to his mm. name so. yes again uh, don carson i can't find where he wrote it but i remember a very striking phrase his prayer was oh lord let me not outlive my love for thee yeah 
which is, oh, is very striking, isn't it? Um, and be careful what you choose. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so this guy, this freedom fighter, um, who is the king... So Babylon isn't big here, is it? No. Is it? Um, it's, a, um, it's also been subject to Assyria... And yep. there have been these rebellions uh, against Assyria, which must have been a scary thing to do. I guess, again, a little bit like sort of things going on in Eastern Europe with, with Russia being mm. the big kind of mm. bully um, state. It'd be quite scary to pit yourself against, as, as Ukraine has had to. Um, it's that sort of thing, It is, it? and so therefore you want to find somebody else who's yes. also being... Yeah. And Hezekiah may not be a freedom fighter, but we know he's being a bit of a rebel for faith mm. reasons. Uh, I'm assuming mm. your chronology here yes this is before the Assyrians attack and so he's been a bit of a rebel for faith reasons yes and so you know it's a natural kind of oh you know maybe we could help each other I think that's what's yes, going on absolutely um and then you you really emphasize the his so what's actually happened in Hezekiah's heart do you think well I think two things he's become proud and he's become self-reliant um and the pride is horrible isn't it because he's 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 done nothing. I mean, oh, hang on. I've got to get into your head, right? Sorry. Wait a minute. I've got to change my chronology. Okay, wait a minute. So uh, uh, the <laughs> deliverance of Israel hasn't happened. Uh, sorry, the deliverance of Jerusalem hasn't happened. But um, uh, I still think he's being a bit cocky and a bit proud. And he's doing his old thing about relying on political alliances and I think what he's thinking is yeah I could go up against Assyria but I'd need to make these careful little alliances rather than depending on God mm. and on his word but if the Assyrian on. campaign was actually chronologically it works before nicely. this it works very nicely that he's yeah. like there's been a, a major yeah. victory and then so, so that's quite a, a useful spiritual principle isn't there after a a, mm. a spiritual kind of victory or success or a mission or something like that that's time when we have to watch ourselves very carefully because you can become complacent, can't you? Yeah, and I think also we... I, I, I mean, I'll be very honest. I think we we tend to... Oh, all right, I. I can be proud about things that have nothing to do with me. Right. So, for example, I'm chaplain of Leicester Tigers, and it's very easy to get proud of that. But I did nothing. You contributed I, I nothing contributed on the r rugby pitch. Z but it's not not even not even on the spiritual pitch. It's not that that Les Tiger's gone. Well, let's go and have that guy. Basically, a, a, a friend of a friend of a friend knew me and went, "Come on, up to you live a mile away. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah, just go and do it." And uh, what right have you got to be uh, proud about it? But but we do that all the time. We yes. get you know. Um, yes. If I'm proud, even about my physical accomplishments or my academic accomplishments or my business accomplishments I who am I to be proud because God has given me the strength mm. and the gifts to mm. do that everything we do now I'm not him. saying that we have to be so you know there's another extreme where you say thank you very much to the sermon I go oh no 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 it's not me Fiona it's not me it's all the Lord it's not me but thank you Fiona uh thank you that God has used me in this Okay, that would mm. is that a better response? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because then you're saying that God is the one, because He does use people, doesn't He? Yes. If you refuse to accept any thanks, that can also be yes. quite a sort of inverted pride, can't can't yeah. it? I think pride just grows so quickly in the human heart, doesn't it? It's, it's horrible. It's like the ivy in my garden that you're just constantly pulling up mm. because you 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 never actually get rid of it, do you? So I talked about um, Thanksgiving being a kind of an mm. acid to corrode pride. Can you think of anything else that might um, we can employ to destroy uh, it? I think being in a church family is very good um, because because it helps us to see that it's what we're doing together. Yeah. You know, I can contribute a little bit, but I'm only the hand or the foot or the toe or whatever. And it's together in a church family that, the, oh, that's that we good. serve God. So what that does... You don't does, get the, hand, the, the finger no, going, no, no, oh, no. look at me, I'm such a great thumb. Um, but that, that works too... That's like Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and it works two ways, doesn't it? On the one hand, it knocks down pride because, yes. hang on a second, you know, if the service was great this morning, there are loads of people involved in that. Fantastic. 
but it works the other way. It's an encouragement that, oh, do you know what? If I'm helping in the crash, I'm really helping what's going on Absolutely. at, at the front. Absolutely, yeah. from the people who unlock the doors to, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have happened if no. we hadn't hadn't had people no. early. I think the other thing that is humbling in a church family is recognising the majority of the older people. A lot of people this week have said to me, I pray for you often, yeah. every day. Um, just really, really grateful for that. And you think we're out doing stuff, mm. but actually it's only because people are praying mm. for us um, that, that anything's happening at all. So I think, again, that, that is quite humbling, isn't it? And I guess the most important thing is that if the king of the universe was willing to humble himself and die on a cross, me going, oh, look at me, everyone, that yeah. is pretty ugly, oh, isn't it? Ridiculous. So, yeah. I know. used, I didn't use this illustration, but it was a lovely illustration I read this week of a guy looking at the Rocky Mountains and going, oh, wow. So he's looking at these immense mountains. Oh, this is, inc my eyesight is fantastic. Do you know, I've got the most amazing eyesight. And it's kind of like, what? It's not your eyesight. It's the mountains that are amazing. Yes, and exactly. I think it's that kind of thing. We've got it all kind of Yes, we have it kind of back wrong. to front, yeah. don't we? Because we're, we're very much so our centre. Hezekiah's proud. He's self-reliant. Um, uh, and you get that in the his. I've actually underlined his, in his, verse his, two. His, constant his. One, it's two, all about three, his. four, five, his. And also in these, it's yet another political uh, alliance that he's mm. seeking to make. He's already tried to make one with Egypt. He's now trying to make one with Babylon. Mm. And it's kind of like, no, Hezekiah, make it with, you remember that the Lord has, in a sense, made an alliance with you. It's all down to him. Mm. Just rely on that. And, and the fact that he receives them gladly. Yeah. Um, and doesn't give any praise to God. And it, the fact that, I mean, because it seems like a weird thing, someone comes to visit you with the grapes, you know, you've just got over a major illness and you start, you know, you get your bank balance out. Mm. It kind of seems to be what he's doing. But the fact that he's doing this and their envoys, that suggests that there's a political mm. thing going on. It's not just a kind of um, a sort of um, convalescent visit. And the, and the other thing he doesn't do um, is he doesn't pray. That's quite striking, no. isn't it? So that doesn't shows he doesn't ask God what he should do. And then Isaiah, in verse 3, talk us through that, his response so, to Isaiah pitches up. Isaiah pitches, and poor old Hezekiah must be, oh, no, it's Isaiah again. Um, <laughs> he says two questions. What did those men say and where did they come from? Uh, Hezekiah answers one question. They came from a distant land. Okay what did they say and you kind of know what they said you know oh, you're great as kind of, we've heard all about you you're just fantastic oh look at all these riches you know but he doesn't mention any of that no no so we kind of know that things things are, are not looking good mm. in verse three there's a kind of hint that that things are not um are not going in a good direction and i think the other thing is the other time we know when something very similar happened to this was when the queen of sheba visited solomon yes and when she leaves she doesn't go away going oh solomon you're great um she goes yes. um i had not heard the half of it your god must be very great yes these guys aren't going away saying anything and that's because it's his yeah it's, he's showing them his treasures rather than the treasures that, that god has has blessed them with so yeah so a, a rather well yeah a doom pronouncement really isn't yeah. it um, of what's going to happen um this terrible terrible i mean it's a terrible verse everything is going to be carried off to babylon nothing is going to be left this is god's word and some of your descendants will be taken away they'll become eunuchs in the palace of the king of babylon i mean the most horrendous like you say verse eight with him going oh i that's fine as long as i'm all right it's just the most extraordinary, I mean, it's a terrible prophecy, isn't it? Well, and if you compare it to Hezekiah, you're going to die. Yes, okay. yeah. Now, it's it's not just you're going to die, your whole kingdom will be wiped out and yes. taken away into exile. Yeah. And, and, and Hezekiah accepts the facts of it, but he doesn't accept that it's horrendous, or at least there's yes. piece of security in so my So what life. he should have done when, is when he had this pronouncement from the Lord, the Lord says, you're going to die, and he pleads mercy. Surely here he should have pleaded mercy at yeah. this point, shouldn't he? And he didn't, um, which again is, 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 very, is very striking. 
um, how he fails. So just just take us through. Are there more things you want to add there, or should no, we no, um, take us through the sort of your your kind of final conclusion? Because that was. Um, yeah, so um, we're, we're coming to the end now, the first half of Isaiah, and we're left with questions. God has made uh, promises about a king, about a child who will be born, and he's made promises about a salvation. Mm. And yes, the salvation is in, t in temporal terms often, but it's also in eternal terms, and it's in uh, terms that are to do with uh, spiritual terms, like our sin. Mm. Mm. Um, and God promises to do, and actually death, God promises to deal with those two things. Um, and so we're left now going, oh, we thought it was Hezekiah, but it's not Hezekiah. Well, who is it? And how is God going to deal with my sin? And who is going to deal with it? If it's not Hezekiah. Somebody better must Somebody be coming. better must be coming. Mm. And surprise, surprise, we're going to see that. Um, but I think the first half draws it all i think this is why this is coming to this point we need a perfect salvation and we need a perfect king we've been promised it all the way along um they're meant to encourage one another when it's hard with the yes. promise of perfect yes. salvation they're meant to look for a perfect king but we're left where is he so they're meant to be pleading god's faithful god's promises in the past mm. um in terms of their their, ho their hope in the present and this baby that has been promised the government on his shoulders, um, which is how you ended. Wonderful um, counsellor, mighty yeah, God, eternal counselor. father, and prince of peace. Lovely, um, lovely hints that we've had, um, chapter 9, chapter 11, uh, about what this kingdom is going to look like, and he hasn't come. Yeah. So, yeah, um, he is the only one who can actually, because they don't just need cleaning up, do they? They need their rebellion forgiving. Uh, their rebellion against God. So, and and it's more than that, even because it's it's that, and there have also been promises of the new heaven and the new earth, and beautifully portrayed in lots of different ways. Yes. Um, and we're wondering how's that? Who's going to bring that? Who will be powerful enough to bring that about? Because mm. Hezekiah isn't. Mm. I mean, he's hopeless. Uh, well, he's not hopeless. He was great. He was a great king, but he. He's he mortal and flawed. Yes, exactly. So it's all pointing forward um, to Emmanuel, um, Jesus, um, the, the, the one who will actually come and save. And, and like you said, it kind of makes sense because it's easy to think, oh, what's the Old Testament got to do with anything? But it, it, it sets up. Um, Jesus appearing as you. What were those verses again, Matthew? Well, so, so what, what's so lovely is, you know, we come Malachi to the end of... Um, Here's my page, you know, uh, end of yes. the Old Testament, all of yes. the New Testament. Here's the New Testament, chapter 1, Matthew. Uh, what have we got? Um, uh, verse 20, but after Joseph considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. A dream said, Joseph, son David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. She will give birth to a son, <gasps> and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yes, amazing, isn't it? So Here it is. that really gives the, the, the kind of the, the depth to Jesus suddenly. Jesus doesn't suddenly walk onto the scene, does he? This has been set up and planned for years and yeah. years. So, yeah, so that's the, the gospel in Isaiah. Anything else you'd like to add to that, or shall I just pray? No, that's it, Fiona. I want to say, I think on behalf of everybody here, thank you very much indeed, because you're, you're a genius created under the bonnet, <laughs> so we're really thankful for doing that. Seriously, you've, you've been great. These don't just happen. Uh, it's hard work every week, um, so thank no, you for doing that. it's been a pleasure. It's really um, been good to, to kind of look at it a bit more. So, yeah. Do you think you'll be under the bonneting in your future life? Who knows? Who knows? Um, well, we wish yeah. you all the best with that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me Perfect. just pray. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this uh, fantastic first half of the book of Isaiah. Thank you um, for this promised king um, who was promised. Mm. There are little glimpses all the way through. And yet we know that he is Jesus, your son, who came to save us from our sins. Thank you for living the other side of, of Jesus' coming so that we can look back on it. And we just pray that... Um, 
as we think more about Isaiah, um, as um, Isaiah is, is preached um, uh, next term um, at night, and Father, that people would be so excited to see more of who Jesus is, and that those who don't know him yet will come to know him. So we do thank you and praise you for this wonderful book. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Fiona, thank you. Uh, thank you. We're going to be back uh, September or October for more Under the Bonnet, looking at Isaiah, and I'll have somebody else here to replace Fiona. Thank you. <laughs>